So I'm here to talk about Data Mapper. My tagline here is the persistence framework. I'll uh, get into a little bit more details about why that is, but um, that's what I'm calling it. Um, so who am I, first of all? I work for Engine Yard. Um, probably know who that is. Um, I work on jQuery. I work on Merle. I work on Data Mapper, which is really cool because I have commit access to pretty much all the things I use on a day-to-day -day basis. It works out pretty nicely. I guess I forgot. <laughs> Whoops. Um, so what is Data Mapper? Um, data Mapper is an ORM. Uh, it's like Actor Record. Drops into Rails like Actor Record um, or Merb. And let's take a look at what the architecture looks like. You have your Merb or Rails, which is the application. You then have Data Mapper which talks to Merber Rails. You then have an adapter, which DRB is one of the adapters, and it's just a unified database adapter. You can have YAML or, I don't know, something else that someone's gonna write later. Um, and those talk. Uh, and then you have your database, your set of YAML files, or the something else that someone may create at some later point and that's the data store. So the first thing that you should notice right off the bat is that unlike something like SQL, um, Data Mapper is designed out of the box to work on arbitrary data stores. The API is designed around accessing data rather than creating a good API for SQL. Um, and that's sort of the main difference between that and some of the other alternatives. Uh, there are some caveats about this presentation. The first one is that Data Mapper is a work in progress, um, so 09 should be released like some early next week. So some of the things that I'm talking about here are going to be released in 09 and are not out yet. So I have code here that will not run today, but will run tomorrow. Um, that's sort of the way Data Mapper is right now. Um, I'm also assuming active record functionality, so I'm not talking about here's how you do it in active record and here's a slightly different way you do it in Data Mapper. Um, I'm not going to talk about how to do a has many or a has one or a belongs to or a has many through. I'm not going to talk about migrations because all these things exist in Active Record and have either identical or slightly different implementations in Data Mapper, and I don't have enough time to go through all the little nuances. So I'm going to talk about um, what's cool about Data Mapper above and beyond what exists in Active Record. Um, also, there's code in this presentation, a lot of code. Um, I try to keep the code to things that you would actually do in a real application. So it's like, here's how you would do data mapper in your application. I try to keep the examples as simple as possible so I don't have an entire model anywhere. It's just like little stub models and then whatever I'm talking about. Um, and there's, very, there's no code that's in data mapper itself. So it's, there's a lot of code, but I'm, I hope that will not uh, be a problem. So what does data mapper look like? What does it look like to make a query in data mapper? Um, so, looks like this. Uh, there's no find. So instead of find all and find first, there's just a find and a first accessor. Um, you can see that there's some cool stuff here, like the symbols take greater than, not, um, less than, equals, a bunch of different things like that to make it more easy to do complex queries without having to resort to a condition string. Um, and so what does this create in SQL? It creates this. Um, so you can see that the um, not arrow array got converted into not in Bob Jones. Um, the age is bigger than 30. So basically, it, this gets you into more Ruby-esque writing of cool SQL stuff without having to write SQL as much. Um, what else is true? This is not true in, in Active Record, right? In Active Record, every time you get a new object from the database, it's a new Ruby object, and even though it has the same ID, and I guess you could override equals equals to say if it has the same ID, it's the same object or something, um, they aren't the same Ruby object. In Data Mapper, there's something called an identity map, which basically means when you do zoo.first, it goes and gets it, it gets the ID, let's say the ID is one, and then it gets stored in memory as, we know that, the, that zoo one is this object. And the next time you go to get it, it pulls it out of the identity map. Um, which is really cool for things like you have, you pulled all the zoos and all the animals separately and now you want to go get an animal zoo, let's say, right? So 
it has it belongs to something, you have the foreign key, an active record, even though you might have the zoo in memory, you still can't go and get, you have to go ask the database for it again. Whereas in data mapper, you, ha you just say dot zoo and it will go say, oh, it's zoo number two, I have that in memory here, right? So you have a situation where you, ha you don't have to do as many queries and you have this, which um, if you've run into problems entailing it, you will know that it's cool and good. Um, so how about this? This is like a big no-no in -no record because it's like an N plus one query problem, right? How many queries is it in data mapper? It's two queries in data mapper. Um, the reason for that is that what data mapper does is when you say zoo.all, it says, okay, here's a set of zoos, big array, right? But it's not an array, it's a special set object. And when you go and call animals on any one of them, uh, what data mapper will do is say, oh, it looks like you're starting to uh, start calling some uh, associations from inside of the object, you probably want all of them. Um, and in fact, 99% of the time, that, that's true, right? You're gonna do something like this. Um, so what happens is we have this thing called strategic eager loading, which means that you don't, you pretty much eliminate the N plus one problem. And even for something like a nested tree, where an active record that might be like an absurd number of queries, right? Because it has to keep asking for each child. In data mapper, it's the number of queries you have to do to get a complete nested tree is equal to the number of levels of the nested tree. So five, there's five levels or whatever, not you know, some absurd number. Um, so after we talk about eager loading, there's also a lazy loading technique that we use in data mapper. Um, let's take a look at some code here. Um, I'm gonna talk first about each little piece here, uh, just to let you know what's going on. First of all, we have include data mapper resource. You may notice that we aren't, um, we aren't doing post inherits from data mapper base, right, which you would do in active record. What this means is that you could take any object that you have and make it persistible, right? So basically all you have to do is you take, your, you take an object that you have out in the world, you include data mapper resource, and now all you have to do is specify which instance variables you wanna have persist, um, because in data mapper, instance variables are the same thing as properties and you can then save a, an arbitrary object. It may inherit from something. You don't have to worry about the fact that it doesn't inherit from data mapper base. You know, it may inherit from some random thing, and you can now persist whatever you want. Um, property, ID, fix num, serial, true. So this is the basic setup of a data mapper property. You say what its name is, you say what class it is. Um, we'll get into that a little bit more later. And you say, in this case, that it's a serial column. Um, title as a string, um, and here's what I was getting at with the lazy loading. You can say lazy true. Um, what lazy true means is that when you, load the, when you load the thing the first time, get all the things that aren't lazy loaded, right? So get, in this case, the ID and the title. Then if you actually ask for the body, then go get it. This is really useful if you have a situation where you have an index page which has a lot of things that you wanna get but then some other page where you, ha you want the whole thing, right? So in the index page, you're not gonna ha necessarily load all these columns. They may be big text columns. Maybe, God forbid, you have images in the database. Um, you can lazy load these things and only get them when you need them. Um, and of course, uh, because it's in a set, once you start lazy loading one thing, it goes and gets everything in one query, so it's not like you have to constantly do queries every time you try to get a lazy loaded element from one object that's in a set. Okay, so that's the end. Um, okay, let's take a look at some what data mapper maps to what's equal. So in this case, we had a lazy loaded column, so when we did posts equals posts at all, it said select ID title from posts, right? Let's assume that it returns two objects that have IDs one and two, and then you do post.first.body. That'll do select body from posts where ID is in one, two, right? In other words, we got two objects back there in our set, now go get the lazy loaded column, because I now asked for it. Right, but if I do this, the only SQL query that gets called is the exact same SQL query, right? Because once I have it once, I have the identity map and I can just get the other ones out when I need them. There's also a really cool thing called lazy loaded grouping. And what that means is that we have property title string and instead of saying lazy true, you say lazy details. And here you say the body has lazy details. And what that means is that when any lazy loaded column gets asked for that's in a group, in this case details, it'll get all the lazy loaded columns that are in that group. So in this case, I have 
some, for some reason I have a, a database, a table that I only want to get the ID for the index. Uh, maybe it's for an API or something. And then as soon as I do dot title, it'll get me the title and the body because they're in the same lazy loaded group. Okay. So that's lazy loading. There's, those are some uh, nice enhancements that help you build more efficient things than you could easily build when you have to stick with either you know, writing raw SQL or writing the little Ruby that you have access to. Um, let's talk a little bit about you know, the fact that you can go off the golden path in data mapper. You're not trapped in either it's the default or the crazy you know, writing everything raw SQL yourself. So this is a, a stripped down data mapper model. Um, this is what, I'm, what I want to talk about, which is that you can specify for any class. There's a new repository called legacy, which you define elsewhere, and we'll uh, talk a little bit about how you do that in a l later. But you can say for the legacy database, the title property has a field of weird thing, right? Um, weird thing. So what this allows you to do is it allows you to have a database for which all the model logic is the same, but the mapping, you might have a legacy database or you know, YAML, a list of YAML, data, uh, YAML files or whatever store you want that have different conventions for what the names are. Right, so you can say is when I do this with a default, it's just a title, do the regular data mapper defaults, which are the same as the active record defaults. But if I want to call the legacy repository, um, then it has a special field. And you don't have to care about this. You can just say dot title and it'll know, oh, it has this weird field name. And you obviously could, might be able to do this for any, as many as you want. The nice thing about this is that if you have a bunch of fields and only some of them are different, you can specify the regular one, all of them on the top level, and then what goes inside of repository legacy is just overrides. So if you have 10 property names um, and only two of them have special weird names in the legacy database, you only have to specify those two in the legacy block. Um, so how do you actually call posts in the legacy repository? So it looks like this, post.all, and you can specify repository in the conditions hash. Or this is equivalent, repository legacy do post all. Um, the top one is really syntactic sugar for the bottom one. The bottom one you would use if, for example, you had a bunch of things to do in the legacy database and you didn't want to have to keep specifying repository legacy, right? So now you say repository legacy, while I'm in here, all the models that I talk about use the legacy repository to access them. Um, so similarly, post.all by default means the same thing as that, right? So post.all, looks like, oh, it's just post at all, same thing as active record. Behind the scenes, it's identical to this and this. Um, basically, there's a default repository that if you don't specify, it becomes that. Um, and f I guess for most cases, in most like new projects, you wouldn't even care about this. You would just omit the uh, default all the time and you'd be done. But if you had a legacy database you wanted to import data from or occasionally use, you'd be able to specify, in this case I want to use the default, in this case I want to use the, uh, the legacy one. Okay, now we have naming conventions. So in active record, you're, you, have, you have to either decide all of my tables are uh, named the way that active record wants them to be named with plurals or whatever, or I have to do set table name on every table. Right? In data mapper, you can specify what the naming convention for your table is. So there are some built-in ones like underscored or underscored and pluralized. Um, but you can do this really cool other thing, which is say the naming convention is a lambda. Um, and you can specify, let's say your table name always starts with TBL. It's some weird legacy thing. And that's just what it is. So you can specify that it's table class.camel case. And all the tables, the first time that they have to figure out what table they are, it'll run that lambda against the class name, and you're done. OK. Um, you can also specify for a given, a given model that you want the default repository to be something different um, just by overriding the default, default repository name method. So for instance, you might have a bunch of, of classes that are basically only there to exist for legacy purposes. It's not something that you're converting legacy into new, but you just have these legacy databases that you want to have access to. So in this case, you want to specify legacy is the one I mean when I say post.all, right? I don't mean to go to the default. Um, you get a nice API for importing data, which is just post.copy legacy default. And you get an even cooler API um, if you want to only 
import some data in which you can use those same selectors that you saw earlier for deciding in queries what to use. You can say that here. So post.copy legacy to default and create that, create it as greater than a year ago. So now I'm only copying over the posts from the legacy database that are a year or more old. Yes, sir. Um, it, so there's basically, it depends on the repository that we use. Today, it generates basically an insert statement for every single one. But um, if the repository supports it, we're definitely going to have multiple insert support so that you can do that and then have it generate like one giant insert statement for everything. But um, for, I'm sorry? Yeah, or what, basically the most efficient way to achieve it with the given store. Obviously, with something like YAML, you're, you're going to have to do multiple insert statements. Um, yeah, and so just a reminder, you can do this field thing, which means that you basically can copy over from a legacy to the default database without having to specify what the mapping looks like because you've already specified it. So that's importing of data. Is it possible to have the, um, different repositories have different backends? Uh, yes. So what he asked was, is it possible for different repositories to have different backends? Yes. The, pretty much the mission here is to make data mapper not care about what the back end is. So you can have a SQLite database as your legacy database or a Postgres database as your legacy database and the, um, and the MySQL database as your default database or something. It, basically, as long as you stick with using data mapper queries, it puts everything through the thin, um, thin eye of data mapper and then converts it back on the way out. So it takes the data, puts it into normalized form, and then puts it back out the other end. So we have, we also have custom types. So in Active Record, you're used to seeing, you have basically whatever types of database supports, and maybe you can do some serialized thing for objects, right? So we have custom types. First, what primitives do we have? We have true class, string, text, float, fixed num, big decimal, date time, date, object, and class. And basically, the repository um, stores are required to implement how each of these should be handled, right? So. Uh, true and false and string and text and float, all of these are just required to be specified on the store how they should be serialized. And then the store will handle the serialization and deserialization. So those are, those are all supported by default. Um, things like object would probably be implemented by either Marshall load and dump or, um, or YAML load and dump. But yeah, these are all supported by default and the ones that come with data mapper and any other adapters that were created would simply have to implement these same uh, load and dump routines. Um, but custom types are, go beyond that. So what if I have a post and I want to specify some special things like um, my author is actually a full name and my details are in CSV, right? And what I want to do is I want to be able to, while I'm working with the object in the ORM, I want it to look like C, uh, CSV or an array form and I want it to look like a, an array from the name first and last, but I don't want to have to deal with any of the messy details. I just want the uh, database to know that last comma first gets deserialized into an array of first comma last, right? So warning, there's a bunch of code ahead, um, and it's just sort of for purposes of illustration. It's not necessarily not necessary that you necessarily understand all the pieces in each routine, um, but I guess I just have it. So here's how you would implement full name. This is trivial, obviously. Uh, the top piece has a primitive string. So you say, in the database, this is a string and it has a size of 100. And you can use, you might be able to use any of the other primitives that we defined on the previous slide. Um, and you just have to specify a load routine, which says how I want to handle it coming in from the database, what I want it to do, and a dump routine, which says I'm going to have an array, how do I want to serialize it into the database. Um, similarly, CSV works the same way. You just have to specify a load and dump routine, what primitive it, it's based on, and then what does the create look like? So it looks like this. So we have a create, we say title, which is a string, but then we get to say author, which is an array, which might come really in handy um, if you have a form and you can specify you know, first and last name and you can use the properties of forms to make it come in as an array, and then you don't have to worry about doing any kind of serialization logic on your own. It will just get handled for you. And then metadata, that's just something that needs to get converted into a CSV file. And what does that look like in the database? It looks like this, right? It looks like whatever the dump routine said that it should do. Um, also, it's lazy parsed. What lazy parsing means is just that we take the data um, 
from the database unless you lazy load it. So let's say you didn't lazy load it. We take the data out of the database as a string, and until you actually ask for .csv, .details, or whatever, it stays as text in memory. But as soon as you start asking to do anything with it, it becomes the right thing. That means that if you have difficult routines that take some RAM or CPU, you don't have to worry about the fact that every time you're using these special classes, I just want to build an index, you know, I want an index page, I don't want to have to do all these, I don't want to undo the CSV, or I don't want to care about the name at this point. Um, you don't have to until you actually ask for it, and then it will unparse it. Okay. We also have custom stores. So stores are URIs. They look something like this. Uh, MySQL colon slash slash user at localhost. And you set them up like this. So datamapper.setup, default, MySQL colon slash slash local, user at localhost. And this is how the database knows when you say repository legacy or repository default or repository whatever. This is how the database knows what you mean, right? So you, don't, you set it up once, you say, here's what the default database means. And then every time in, in datamapper that you use the default database, um, it'll know to access this repository. Datamapper has um, connection pools. Uh, which means that it's thread safe and uh, there's con you don't have to worry about connecting to, my to diff MySQL databases. The data mapper will handle the connection pool for you. This is not finalized, but the database.yaml will probably look something like this. So you'll specify something similar to what you have right now and it will get converted into those URIs. Here's what you, know, you might say legacy SQLite. Um, but custom stores go beyond that. You might have something like this, yaml colon slash 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 fixtures. Um, maybe at some point in the future, SSH plus yaml colon slash slash fixtures. Um, obviously, this is probably not going to get into 1.0, but the, the simplicity of the way that the store API works means that it's relatively trivial to take, um, make any sort of store and make it work. So as long as you have a way of getting, getting at data and having it implement those types that we talked about earlier, um, you can pretty much do anything. Uh, Sam, who wrote Data Mapper, was joking yesterday about a, you know, IRC colon slash slash data store. Um, <laughs> yeah, you, uh, it basically the, the options are pretty limitless and there isn't a ton of code that you have to implement. Um, so that's cool. Um, for tests, you probably would have something like this, right? And now that, you, now that you have a YAML store, you no longer have to actually, assuming you don't have any SQL in your database or in your uh, models, there's no reason to have to actually take the fixtures and load them into any database, right? You can just use Data Mapper to access the YAML store yourself directly, right? And YAML stores will support things like joins, associations, um, all the features that are supported by regular databases will be supported they will probably be too slow to use in any legitimate production sense, but for tests, they'll probably be more than fast enough. Um, and this will save you some of the horrors of having to deal with uh, loading and dumping fixtures in and out of the database. And yeah, adapter YAML, which is cool. Um, so how do you make fixtures? The obvious answer is something like this, right? Post.copy default fixtures. Um, you won't even have to specify any sort of repository information in the models because YAML will support all the default stuff. So the field names will just be whatever, and the table names will just be file name dot YAML. Um, so you'll have a table will basically be a file with a bunch of YAML documents inside of it, which will be records. Um, and you'll simply be able to do post.copy default fixtures, and you have your fixtures. You're done, right? But there will probably be a rake DB copy fixtures that does that for you. Uh, it occurs, I have more stuff, but it occurs to me that I'm well behind, well ahead of schedule, so I'll probably open everything up to questions shortly. Um, so validations. I said I wasn't going to talk about things that are in Active Record, but uh, there's, this works sufficiently different that it's worth talking about. So we have class product, right? And we have property title string and What's cool is that that automatically generates a validates length of, right? So the database has some amount of characters that string means, right? And if you just do that in Active Record, what that produces is a string. And if you try to save to that, it will work and truncate, right? In Data Mapper, that will automatically produce a validation that says, don't be bigger than whatever it is that the database accepts. Um, you're able to say auto validations arrow false if you don't want that behavior, but 
typically you do want that behavior. Um, we also have property, price, string, this thing over here. Nullable, nullable false means validates presence of. And then there's this cool thing called validation context, which lets you say, I only care about this validation in, when you say valid for purchase question mark, right? So say I have a price and I want to be able to import all this data from a legacy database and I don't want it to fail because there's a validation called, you know, validates presence of price, but I don't want people to be able to buy the thing until I have a price in there, right? So now there's validate or valid question mark, which will do the default validations, but there's also valid for purchase question mark, which will check all the validations that have validation context purchase listed, right? Um, which is pretty cool. We also have, you can say format arrow, D, that thing, or you could have, which produces a validates format of, or you can say it's a proc, which takes a string, and that also produces a validates format of. We can say number, and that may have a length of two to 10, which produces a validates length of. And we may, I'm just reiterating, you can do special things, like in this case, I only care about the number on import um, for some reason, so I can have a valid for import situation. Um, now we just showed how you can do it inline. The same old validates length of, validates presence of stuff still works um, with basically the same cool additions that are available like the proc form, uh, format, but you can do them with the old validates length of and you can still do a supply context. In this case you say when import, which produces valid for import. Okay, so. I'm about a half an hour in, which means I'll take questions. Um, so I guess, any questions? Anybody? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, very early on, we were talking about the, uh, the memorization of finding first and things of that nature. What condition caused that decision? Uh, so if you, basically what happens is, uh, sorry, he said um, you do, if you do find one, it gets put into a memorization table called an identity map what would cause it to be reset. Um, so Data Mapper basically tracks, if you do, if you save something, it'll track it in the identity map as well. So if I modify the, if I modify a property, there's a dirty attribute that will get set. So if you do dirty question mark, it's dirty. And then when I actually go and save it, all it does is persist it back, but it doesn't, um, it doesn't actually, do anything to the object except say it's no longer dirty. So there really, there's no reason for it to be reset. Um, if you're doing something with, where you're actually using the connection pool and there's multiple users, um, then what you should do is you should, you should exit out of your session. So Data Mapper allows you to say like, I want this stuff to happen inside an identity map session. So if you're actually expecting people to be changing data that's not in your process, you should put things inside of Data Mapper sessions um, and then the identity map will get closed out after you leave the session and then load it in again. So basically the identity map should be identical to whatever's in the, in the database except for that case and then you should be careful. Yes? Would it be a problem if let's say I have four mongers or things running, each one will have its own identity map, right? right? So if one of the processes deletes one of the record, the other identity maps wouldn't know Right, so again, the, the thing that, the, the saving grace of active record in general is just that these things happen very fast, right? So when you click on, when you make a save from a form, um, active record opens up, does something extremely fast, saves it, and you're done. So any uh, active record has, has a problem where if two people save at roughly the same time, they just they clobber over each other, um, and there's no locking or anything like that, and Data Mapper will have optimistic locking, which is good. but um, the reason why that doesn't really come up very often is because it happens so fast. So similarly, identity maps in Rails or Merb apps are very short-lived, right? So what will happen is um, both the Rails and Merb plugins will say, 
will put the, the identity map session block around your, uh, around your request. So as soon as you start the request, it'll go do the active record, it'll go get the thing, populate the identity map. You'll be able to do other things that'll make use of the identity map, go return the request, and then kill the identity map. Um, so it's really useful for a block of code that's inside of one request, it will, it, unless you want it to persist for your entire, the lifetime of your app, because you're only one process or something, that would not be the default. Anybody else? Yeah. Uh, can you elaborate on how the, uh, uh, the, the pool works with like a threaded web server like uh, you know, Bongo or Smurf? Um, so I probably cannot give you the full technical details, but um, suffice it to say that there, there is a connection pool that doesn't require a thread per connection, so you have a bunch of connections that get reused um, that are in the process. So is it smart enough to like, figure out, okay, we're getting a lot of queries and you spend a couple more connections. Uh, you can make it through that. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. 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 So yeah, it's a good question. Data map, so data mapper will run under JRuby except for the data objects that are B framework. So um, a couple of months ago, I was looking at the state of Ruby database drivers and noticed that they had all been written like more than five years ago by Japanese dudes. They have no consistency whatsoever. The half of, well, big chunks of active record are dedicated purely to making them have what should be a similar interface. Um, so I wrote, I used a Swig interface to build new database drivers for MySQL, SQLite, and Postgres, which became the data mapper core drivers. And then they recently rewrote those to not use Swig anymore, so they're pure C. So those drivers won't run in JRuby. Um, what would need to happen, the thing is that the do.rb driver project was created pure, simply to make a really simple API. So the API basically is open a connection, close a connection, make a new query, um, open a reader. Once you have a reader, go forward with a forward-only cursor until you're done, be able to get the fields from each, uh, at each point in the record set. I think that's the entire API, what I just said. So it wouldn't be hard to write a JDBC adapter that complied with the DORB interface. And then it would work. It's been a while since. So I, I have not installed Data Mapper and have seen it require faster. Maybe it did at one point, though. Yes? It sounds to me like the uh, object ready caching or pooling and testing might be a problem for memory use and you profile memory use of data mapper versus like records? Yeah, so there's basically active record has two modes, the quote-unquote threaded mode and the quote-unquote unthreaded mode. The, the one that is thread safe, which people should be using, um, actually makes a new thread per connection, which is way, way worse, right? Data mapper has a number of threads, but there's a limited number of connections and it's able to reuse them. Um, I guess if you didn't want to have thread safety, you could optimize for something else, but uh, that one of the missions of Data Mapper is to be able to be thread safe and to be able to run inside of Merb without the mutex. So that's a trade-off we made. Other questions? go back to that slide a long, long time ago. So yeah, you can specify in your, that your test database should use a YAML adapter, or if someone wrote an in-memory adapter, that would work too. So basically this, the uh, storage adapters in Data Mapper are also very, have a very small API. They basically just need to implement like all and first and some other joining things. 
So you could, pro you could pretty easily write a simple in-memory adapter that was designed to do effectively what people do when they're mocking out the database, um, and then just say that that's the adapter to use. And as long as that adapter wasn't burdened with table names needing to be something special, or column names needing to be something special, which they shouldn't be, then it would just work. It should just work. Does data map also do write custom SQL snippets to insert queries? Yeah, so you can do um, data mapper supports fine by SQL and the same conditions hash that Active Record does. Um, but the goal is to make that extreme much more rare, right? And um, in addition to that API that I showed earlier with the GT and LT and that stuff, there's also going to be an API in 1.0 that's going to support being able to go do associations. So let me see if I could pull up a um, TextMate window. So if you're not doing custom SQL snippets, then you could potentially, you know, just using the data mapper API as something that was reliable as running on an SQL database, but a lot faster for testing. So let me, so the API is going to look, is that too small? All right, so it's going to look something like zoo.all, zoo.animals. That's act, the other example is a more cleaner. So animal.all, <coughs> zoo, or animal.zoo. And then you'll be able to specify some stuff in here, like you could do, or you could say, you know, if it was in a has one association, that was a number, you'd be able to use the same greater than for. Um, so you'll be able to do, I hesitate to say ambition style queries because it's not as ambitious as ambition, but um, you'll be able to do a lot of uh, join style queries with an API that's similar to the rest of Data Mapper and, and because of that have adapters like in-memory adapters or YAML adapters that work. So yeah, it's definitely, we consider it a bug if there is something that requires SQL that's, re that's common enough that a lot of people are doing it, <laughs> right? We're trying to avoid you having to write SQL, primarily because we want to support other storage strategies, right? Uh, yes? I was wondering if there's any uh, core class except for symbol that you extend? No. Yes? Can you talk about migrations? Yeah, no problem. So I didn't really talk about migrations because they're roughly similar, but there is, there's basically two migration strategies in Data Mapper. Um, there's one auto migration strategy, which is destructive at, mo at the moment. And basically, what auto migrations does is kills your database, goes through all your models, goes through those properties, um, and then makes new tables, right? And if you had a, a dumped your development data into a YAML store, you could trivially then reload the data in. And I, I would, that's the recommended strategy for development, right? Instead of having to keep a database that's crufty and is like, and is old, that way new developers could just run the auto migrations instead of having to run 100 migrations that happen to exist from the past that have no bearing on the present. Um, and, you, and that way you keep your data separate in YAML files and you load them in. And because you can do, you know, zoo.copy default comma YAML, it should be trivial to, to do it, right? So that's the auto migration strategy. There's a, there's a goal for us to have non-destructive auto migrations. Uh, Hobo and Django both have this, which basically allows you to keep some track of what you've done in the past. And when you say auto migrate, it'll say, oh, it looks like you've deleted a column and added a column. That probably means you want to rename the column. So then, you know, is that what you want to do? And if you say yes, it'll like make migrations for you. So that's not going to be in 1.0 one, one pro one oh probably, but will probably be in a 1.x release. So that's auto migrations. The other migration strategy is basically Rails migrations with a couple of exceptions. One of them is that they're not required to be in numbered files. They still have numbers, but the numbers are specified together with the migration. Um, and you can have multiple migrations with the same number as long as they're not dependent on each other. So if me and my friend who are both working on the same project both check into migration number seven and they aren't dependent on each other, which probably they aren't since we're working separately, um, Act, uh, data mapper will just say, oh, you, you, you haven't done migration number seven name foo yet, do it. Oh, you haven't done migration number seven name bar yet, do it. Um, this also allows you to add back migrations if you would want to, like you're already up to migration number 20, but you want to go and add a new migration number three for some reason. 
Um, you'd be able to do that, and Data Mapper would say, oh, you haven't run migration number three named bar yet, so now run it. Um, basically, these are just simplifiers over a lot of problems people have with Rails migrations, mainly that since they're numbered in files, people have problems working in teams. So that solves that. But otherwise, we use, um, we don't use the X dot style. Um, so Rails does, you know, create table, do X, X dot, add column, blah, blah, blah. We use the style that's like, you know, create table, do, add column, um, which was in sexy migrations originally. And we also support um, a syntax for modifying tables that's modify table, and then you don't have to specify the table name throughout all the columns. So if you want to modify 10 columns in a table, you just say, you know, modify table, table name, do, and then you have the column modification without having to specify the table. So I don't know, it's just, just a bunch. The regular classic migrations are Rails migrations minus a lot of the hurt that people have. Cool. What else? Yes, sir. Yeah, um, I was just wondering if you could comment on where uh, the jam is currently versus what you talked about, and then it looks like some of what you talked about is sort of future uh, forward-looking statements. Sure. So pretty much everything that I had in this presentation, with the exception of the YAML plus SSH, is will be in 1.0. Um, 09 should be released this week-ish. Um, the main things that are missing in 09 that will be in 1.0 are uh, there's some association stuff like that syntax that I that syntax I showed earlier in TextMate, um, and there's where there's going to be has many through 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 through, and um, belongs to through, which are not yet in 09 but will be in 10. Um, pretty much everything I showed on the slides will be in 09. And I actually I in doing these slides I spoke to Sam last night who's writing a lot of the code these days and said can I put this on a slide can you commit that this will be in 09 and he said yes. So pretty much everything that's in these slides will be in 1.0, uh, 09 rather. Uh, I made a mistake and I just uh, tried installing it for, through gems and it was 0 0.3. Right, so uh, yes, so this is a similar, similar to what Bird was doing, which is there, um, there's a Git repository which you can download, which is data mapper core, and you can install, you can do rake install and it will install. But at the moment, it's not considered stable enough to be supplanting the very stable data mapper 03. So, yeah, if you do gem install data mapper, it'll still install 03. If you want 09 for now, you gotta rake install it from Git, but there will probably be a gem install data mapper minus minus source data mapper.org soon, and then eventually we'll get pushed to RubyForge. Other questions? Yes, sir. Supported backends? Right now? Yeah. So 09 will have MySQL, SQLite, Postgres, and YAML. Um, I think we'll probably support whatever, a combination of what people ask for between 09 and 10 and what's easy to implement between 09 and 10. But the API, like I said, is very simple. So the anticipation is that weird backends that we don't want to support will still exist and be supported by other people who want to. Um, the DORB project will probably separately add new backends like Oracle. Um, so DORB is like a C API for, for databases, and that's a, a whole different animal than the R other storage API, right? So the storage API is really simple. It just needs you to implement how to find things and by conditions, right, which is trivial. But the, the, once you have SQL in the mix, you have to figure out how to open readers and, gener and send SQL to them and get record sets back. That's different. Yes? Do you have uh, better support for things like placeholders uh, or databases that support them natively? Yes. Um, I would say that, so I know that uh, there are some databases that we currently support placeholders for and some for whom we fake it at the moment. The 1.0 release will definitely have, the 1.0 release that comes with the data, data objects RB library will support placeholders. Um, let me reiterate the question. He said, is there support for placeholders in you know, basically passing in a bunch of, of uh, parameters with the query? Um, there are some databases for which this is extremely efficient and some for which it's a wash. Basically, the goal is that right now, the API lets you say, when you, when you execute a query, it lets you pass in parameters. If we support it right now, it'll pass it in using the placeholder API. And if we don't, it'll just generate the query with interpolation. 
Uh, the goal is to, to the extent that such things are supported, to support it natively. And it will, that, yes? So the API right now supports a forward-only cursor. So to the extent that a, an API actually supports a forward-only cursor that's more efficient than the alternative, we support it in the C API. Um, Postgres has a weird C API where it supports a cursor, but then it makes you load the whole thing into memory anyway, which is weird. So we don't do the cursor API there because it's silly. But yeah, if there's a cursor, like the Oracle driver will probably have this stuff in it. And to the extent that there's a simple way of doing cursors, our AP, the DORB API is cursor oriented, so it's trivial to pass it through if it's supported. Anybody else? Yes, sir. Uh, this is, uh, the auto migration, does, uh -huh. for background, does that come from, uh, was that inspired by auto migration uh, from uh, the Rails point? No. Um, so there's a, actually, as we started investigating this, um, a lot of people have done it. Hobo does it, um, and Django does it. but. I don't know, we, it seems to be a, an obvious idea when you're really thinking about the problem space and a lot of people have come up with it. But there's definitely the plans for, out, for the one that we're doing is pretty, like, pretty wicked. It does more things than some of the other ones. Um, it, it does better inferencing about what you mean by things. Um, and obviously the, there's, I haven't really talked about this, but uh, I implicit in this whole conversation is the fact that Data Mapper makes you say what the fields are and I guess the active record people, that may seem weird, but there's a lot of leverage out of it. The fact that you can specify validations in line, that you can do auto migrations, um, that you can specify, hello? Um, you can specify things that, other, that in Rails have to be separate lines in line, lets you have like a one definitive place for here's the schema, here's what it means in the database, and here's what it means to my, to my model which ends up being really powerful if at first makes you queasy because you're used to active record not making you have to do it. Anybody else? Okay. I guess that's it if there's nobody else.